If you saw my CNC laser upgrades video, then you saw that I used it to create a smaller template of my body design. Okay, so I think I'm actually happy with this size for the child size base or the itty bitty behemoth as we're gonna call it. As it currently stands, it works, but this bridge is a little further forward than I'd want because it's a guitar scale and I want it to look more like a bass where the bridge goes all the way to the back. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut off these last two frets here so I can install the neck a little bit further back like this. And then I'll be able to cut off about an inch so I can probably move this back about an inch. And then that's gonna look more like a bass in my opinion. And cutting this off is gonna give us more space in between for our pickups. So I can do one closer to the neck, one closer to the bridge, standard jazz bass layout. And I think that'll sound pretty good. Let's go ahead and cut this off. I measured what I'm guessing will be the length of the truss rod and I shouldn't run into it, uh, but I guess we'll see what happens. I'm Dan, this is Guns of Guitars, let's get started. So what I'm doing here is I drew out my neck pocket and my bridge placement and I'm just marking a center line so I know where to put the pickup routes. And the idea is I want to be able to use light burn and my laser cutter to make complete router templates. We're going to test out this idea on the itty bitty behemoth first before we try to do it on the full size. Man, it sure is hard to beat the speed and accuracy of a CNC machine, isn't it? So my initial tests show that the alignment is good. Let's go ahead and cut one out of wood. That is snug, I like that. That's perfect. Pretty sweet. Doesn't get much more aligned than that. So I'm stretching myself creatively a little bit today, trying a different type of finish than my typical stains and dyes. Although it's gonna start out the same. I'm gonna start out with some black red dye. I practiced this technique on some scrap and it turned out really good. So let's see if I can replicate it. Now I'm just sanding it back with some 320 grit sandpaper. And my inspiration for this was that this Polonia has such a nice, beautiful open wood grain. I really wanted to show it off, but Polonia also is extremely soft and it scratches and dents really easy. So I wanted to protect it really well, which means I probably can't use my traditional oil finishes. But I got something cool in store, you just wait and see. Now, once I'm done mixing up this blue epoxy resin, I'm just gonna coat the whole entire thing. And it's really gonna make that wood grain pop and it's gonna give it a nice little blue tint to it. 
And hopefully, I mean, I tested on some scrap and it had some squared edges and it didn't run off the edges, but uh, who knows if that'll happen with rounded edges. We'll see. Never done this before, you know? Here goes nothing. So unfortunately, an inherent flaw with doing this type of finish is one, you have to work really hard to get the micro bubbles out, which as you can see, uh, I did a pretty lousy job at. So the uh, finish looks great from about a foot or two away, but when you look up really close to it, you can see those flaws in the finish. Um, the other thing is how do you blend the sides and the back? Now I intentionally kind of let it run down the sides on purpose because I wanted from the front this thing to look really nice. Um, and on the back, it honestly did much better than I expected. Like it actually uh, ran down this belly contour and actually smoothed out pretty well. So I think I'm gonna be able to just trim off the excess with a razor blade and then finish this. And I think it'll look pretty good. The only really ugly spots are right up here. But again, I think I could probably trim that off with a razor blade and then I'll do the epoxy on this side. All right, so having peeled back the tape, uh, this is more or less a bit of a fail. Uh, first, the successes. Uh, the control plate cover came out perfect, but it was the flattest, easiest object to do, but that thing looks amazing. I wish the whole base looked like that. Um, the truss rod cover came out pretty good with the exception of this little spot right up here that got really thin for some reason. I don't know if it's the wood grain um, and the epoxy just soaked in right there, but you can see it kind of bubbles. Um, the headstock turned out pretty okay. You can see a little like dips and grooves and a couple of bubbles that um, didn't quite smooth out. So the front still looks mostly good, except for there's areas where the masking tape failed. So like right here, uh, the epoxy uh, ran down the masking tape and then got onto my original first try attempt on this. Happened right there as well. And then this is all just a disaster. You can see where the epoxy like pulled up and built up underneath the masking tape and it even covered the masking tape in a couple spots like right here where that bit of masking tape I can't even get out. It's, it's trapped underneath the epoxy. Um, and then the back in general is a complete disaster. It looks like it has like water stains on it from the first uh, layer of epoxy that I did on the front where it bled onto the back. I thought that the second layer would just blend into it, but it didn't. You can see that it, it left like these nasty spots kind of all around like this. And then anywhere that it's a curved surface, it's just generally a disaster. It's really built up and thick right here on the seam. Um, and then this is just, you know, you can see just tons of like drips and runs and sags and stuff like that. So uh, I could call this a fail and throw it in the trash, but my opinion is that fails are not fails if you fail at the right thing and if you learn a lesson from it. So one, I tried something new um, and I failed at it. And I think you're allowed to fail if you fail doing the right thing, like trying something new and branching out. Um, but two, I learned a lot of lessons. One, I think I put the epoxy on way too thick. I just kind of poured it on and smeared it with a spoon. What I think I need to do is then go back and scrape it with a spatula probably. The reason why I left it so thick is because I really liked the color that it was leaving. Um, and the thinner it was, the less color there was. So I think my lesson that I learned is I need to add more color to the resin and put a thinner layer. Then there's gonna be less opportunities for drips and runs and sag and stuff like that. Um, and then number two, I just need to focus a lot more on my masking, make sure I mask off really good uh, even for the first coat. Lessons learned, um, but the learning doesn't stop there. I need to learn how to fix this, should this ever happen again. So we're gonna try some things, see if we can't get this finished to kind of even out, smooth out, and uh, see if we can't make lemonade out of lemon here. So I'm gonna try a few things, and uh, if it works, I'll let you know what I did. All right, so I was able to mostly save it. It's not quite as glossy as it once was, but uh, I was able to level down sort of the drips and sags, and it looks a thousand times better. It's still not perfect. 
Um, but I wasn't going for perfect. I was going for learning my lessons. And uh, I'm happy with this for an instrument that I'm building for myself. Um, but if I was building for someone else, I probably would just start all over again because uh, I don't want to send anything out that, that is bad. So to save it, I ended up sanding it back with some 320 grit sandpaper, just using my orbital sander and one of these foam sanding pads. These are really great because they help prevent hot spots when you're sanding so that you don't sand through one piece harder than another just because you're having more contact or friction. It kind of helps spread the contact better, especially on these curved sort of contours and stuff. Now there were a few spots where I still did burn through the epoxy entirely and I took off some of the finish. And so I ended up just going back with that same writ dye that I used originally and touched up those areas. And you can hardly tell that I did that. And just sanding back actually left me with a really cool matte finish on this thing, um, which I really liked. But um, I think most of you who are considering doing this are doing it because you really want that high luster gloss finish. And so to bring some of that gloss back, I ended up just going over it with three thick coats of true oil, uh, just because I really wanted to build up some of that sheen. And then after that, I did three more coats of true oil, uh, just lightly buffing with steel wool in between. And uh, I didn't, you know, do any wet sanding or polishing or anything like that. So all you're seeing is, it's, it is sort of a dull gloss finish. It's not a mirror gloss finish, but um, I think it looks really nice. Again, I'm very happy with it. It's not perfect. There are still some spots where I wasn't able to sand all the buildup all the way off. And then of course, the marks from the epoxy uh, bleeding through on the first and then going over it on the second um, still show. So like I said, it's not perfect. Um, from a foot away, it looks gorgeous. Uh, but if you look up close and in the right light, you can still see some of the imperfections. But overall, I'm still very happy with it. And uh, I learned a lot of lessons. I'm definitely gonna try this epoxy finish again in the future. So the reason I'm not using my standard bridge on this build is because th since this thing is such a short scale, you know, 24 and three quarter inches, uh, there's just not enough room for the strings to properly expand the way they normally would across a 34 inch scale. And so I can't use my standard 19 millimeter string spacing. I suspected it would be around 17 millimeters and it actually turned out to be about 17 and a half, which is not bad. That's still wider than most five string uh, string spacing. So I got these individual saddles just because I didn't know what it was gonna be. And these, I know that I could go as close together as 15 millimeters if I needed to. Um, but as you can see, I've got them pretty well spaced apart to get that 17 and a half millimeter string spacing. The only problem is I forgot with individual saddles, it's always kind of a pain point to connect your bridge ground wire because they're all individual. So I'm just gonna use my shielding tape and I'm just gonna go just a thin piece right across this back set of screws right here. And then I'll just ground it to that first one that's closest to the control cavity. And then I think what I'm gonna do, just color some of this in with Sharpie. Not that Sharpie though. It does at least help it disappear a bit. All right, do a quick test for continuity. Perfect, okay. Well, not the best solution, but it works and you can hardly see it with that Sharpie on there. So that'll work. So for the pickups on this thing, I'm doing something a little bit weird and different. These are pickups from my custom shop, but these were, well, I had to do a lot of trial and error before I got the sound that was in my head. And uh, we'll just say that these pickups were error. So they weren't quite how I wanted them, but I paid for them, so I'm gonna use them. What I have here are two neck pickups. And the reason why I did that is because the string spacing is so much more narrow, I was afraid that especially for the bridge pickup, and it looks like it's probably gonna be the case for the neck pickup also, that the strings aren't gonna align with the pickup poles. So you also notice that these are the bigger quarter inch Alnico uh, magnet poles. So that will help a lot with the string alignment. Um, if it's not perfectly centered between those two poles, it'll be just fine still, because there's gonna be a much bigger magnetic field for those. I think it's gonna be okay. The only problem with doing two neck pickups is that they're not gonna be reverse wound and reverse polarity from each other. So there's not gonna be any hum canceling, which is okay because this is not gonna be a bass that I ever gig. This is just gonna be a toy that hangs out in my kid's room for them to learn how to play bass. So I'm just gonna see how these work first. 
Okay, the bass is all done. It's strung up. It works. It sounds good. It actually plays really good. And we have plenty of string tension because I decided to string it up B-E-A-D, but then I tuned it to standard tuning, E-A-D-G. So all these strings are tuned up a fourth, and that's how I was able to overcome the short scale string tension conundrum. And I would say that that was a good choice mostly. And here's why. If you take a gander over at the headstock, you can see something that's absolutely ridiculous. Look at how many times I had to wrap around the B and E strings. And the reason why I had to do that is because the strings are so thick since I had to cut them off so short, because again, we're only a 24 inch scale. We're not even a 30 inch scale. I had to cut them off so short that um, the full wind was what was wrapping around the tuning, tuning peg, making that 90 degree break coming out of the tuning peg. I broke two E strings trying to wind it up the standard way. And that's when I realized that these strings at their full thickness can't do a full 90 degree bend. So actually on my third try, uh, I cut the string off way longer than necessary, you know, towards the end of the bass string where it starts to taper off. I cut it off there so that I could get that 90 degree bend right there without the string breaking. But then I had to wind up all that extra slack on uh, the E and the B string. And because those strings are so thick, it just looks absolutely ridiculous having that many wines on there. It just looks like a mess. It honestly drives me nuts, but it's functional and that's the most important thing. All right, if I get time, I will record a quick sound demo for you guys. Um, but the most important thing was just to see if I could make this short scale 24 inch bass work and I did. So the more important thing for me to do now is to finish building those kits for my clients. So I got four more bodies to build and four more necks to fit. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And if I get done in time, I'll record you guys a nice demo of this guy. All right, got those four base kits done. I started filming the whole process, but I was like, you're already watching me build one of these. Why do you want to watch me build four more? So I quit filming just so I could get it done and get this sound demo recorded. So let's go ahead and lay down some tunes. Thank mm -hmm. you. 